All right, guys. Uh, I have Levi Cooper with me. You know him as Tucker Knight or mononymously Tucker from WWE. We're going to be talking about his wrestling career, future plans, uh, what he's been up to. How are you doing today? Doing really good, man. Yeah, just, uh, you know, enjoying, been enjoying time with my family. Uh, my daughter just turned three and, uh, and my wife's a school teacher, so she's off during the summer. So, you know, just been... Uh, been spending been catching up on time at home over the last few years there you go yeah nothing uh beats time at home with the family especially when you can all be together i absolutely understand that uh especially after this year um you know you've had some time to think about it you were released on april 15th uh letting the situation settle like how are you approaching free agency You, you you know by the time this airs you're in the clear uh what, what are your thoughts now that, you know, you're, you're that much closer to kind of taking your own path, so to speak? Well, I mean, in terms of, well, I'm, I'm excited first and foremost, mostly. I mean, uh, you know, for whatever the reasons, uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss some of those, like, um, you know, once I was split from Otis, things didn't work out, you know, in the way that I would have hoped for them to work out. Um, I wasn't feeling particularly creatively fulfilled. So, um, you know, having this time to kind of step back and reassess, um, you know, do I want to keep wrestling? Yes, I do want to keep wrestling. Okay. Um, in a perfect world, what does that look like for me? What are my new goals? You know, what are the things that I want to try to do? Um, because for me, you know, that's kind of always, um, the journey is the thing that's most important to me. It's not always, you know, what I'm trying to attain necessarily just understanding that setting my goals is, you know, the way that I in- get better incrementally. And so, um, you know, I try to think about as cliche as it is about like my new wrestling character, if you will, as being like a house, you know, okay, I'm starting from scratch again. I'm going to build a house. Like what's the foundation of that house for me that that foundation is amateur wrestling It's the reason why I'm, became a pro wrestler in the first place. Um, you know, and I feel like it's the thing that's given me my mentality and the thing that's, uh, that I use most off of it often in my life, you know, that I, the lessons I learned from amateur wrestling, I apply to several avenues of my life. And so, um, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is just strip away some of the facade. That's what I'm going by my name, Levi Cooper. You know, you could look me up, you could see the things that I did before, I got to WWE, Um, you know, I I put my food on the table and I paid for my college by beating people up. Uh, And, you know, I want to get back to doing that and and make sure that everyone who watches me understands uh, the things that I'm capable of doing physically. Yeah. Um, No, I I obviously like, you know, losing your job sucks. You've said that, Uh, but something that you posted. And, you know, if I, if I can take a positive approach to it, you had quite possibly like the best confirmation that you were released when you posted the the making lemonade tweet. So, I mean, is that something you want to show people more too? Like, I know that was posted at a time where, you know, you were a little frustrated, but is that something that not only are you going to show people your amateur background and, you know, strip it down, but are you going to try to keep things on a positive like that, where you can, you know, maybe be a little uh, self-deprecating, if that's the right term, or, you know, a little bit humorous? Uh, yes, definitely. You know, I, um, I've, I've gotten pretty big into stoic philosophy. It's kind of like the way that I try to live my life, essentially, or whatever. Marcus Aurelius, he, he was like the father of stoicism. He kind of talks about living in accordance with nature. He talks about it over and over and over again in his themes. And so... Um, you know, trying to figure out what that looks like for me and understanding that when I put positivity and when I put happiness out into the world, those are the things that are reciprocated to me. Um, and that, you know, I have a pretty powerful energy that I've learned about myself and that like, uh, the emotions that I'm displaying outwardly, whether those are positive or negative can influence the people around me in a, in a space. Um, and I like, I don't take that for granted, I understand, especially now as I've gotten a little bit older and more mature that like, I have to be responsible for 
you know, making sure and really keying in on the things I'm putting out into the world because I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I've done it forever. And, you know, sometimes I, I could get the boo-boo face, right? I could get real upset and, be, you know, so kind of trying to check myself and, yeah, make sure that, you know, ultimately the things I'm trying to put out into the world are, you know, positive, happy things and, and really trying to um, be deliberate about that is, you know, certainly something I'm going to try to do and, and continue to do, you know, just um, obviously, you know, we're going to talk about DDPY more potentially on this. Um, but that's, you know, that's something that's been helped has helped me a lot. Um, you know, just uh, kind of the meditative aspect, sitting down and at some point in the morning and taking a few moments, you know, to breathe, to stretch, to kind of listen to your body and really get in touch with that. Um, you know, those are all things that I feel like have really helped me get to where I am now and are things I, I feel like I need to put out into the world and, and help other people kind of experience those same self-care things. And, you know, just understanding that you have to fill up your cup before you can kind of, you know, pour that water out into other people's spaces. Staying on the subject of DDPY, was that something that you approached uh, for the physical benefits or was this meditative? Because I know a lot of people, like a lot of wrestlers in the past several years have said, you know, it helps back injuries, like, you know, the physical aspects, but what was, you know, what kind of grabbed your attention? It seems well, like it initially was it was initially it was the physical. Um, I discovered maybe a year and a half ago or so that um I mean, not to, I don't know it's kind of a long story but basically like I was having hip issues and I wasn't able to engage my core properly um and that was making me not able to uh flex my glute properly in some spots my back was picking up the slack and um you know I kind of took inventory of like okay in terms of training, like what have I been going for this whole time? Um, and for the better part of like, you know, 15 years up until my 30th birthday, I had, had spent all my time training in the quest of becoming bigger, faster, and stronger at, a, at essentially not really worrying about the cost, the long-term ramifications of that on my joints and, you know, my mobility and those kinds of things. So I started to realize, whoa, I have some serious core deficiencies here. Like I can squat 500 pounds, but I'm not actually doing it correctly. Like I'm, my technique is actually not right. And that's, if I keep doing it this way, it's going to be a big problem. And so doing DDPY was sort of the way that I realized, oh my God, like these are basic positions. And like, I'm having a really problem breathing in and out through my nose and holding these positions. Like I need to address that immediately. And so I, you know, just started doing it more and more, you know, a couple of times a week. And I eventually got to the point where I was doing it basically every single day. And I just started to notice how when I was doing it every day, especially in the morning, like how much better my day was and not just physically, but just how I was like, you know, it was easier for me to process my thoughts, easy for me to collect myself. And, um, you know, meditation was not something that I ever really did growing up. I mean, as an amateur wrestler, we talk about like visualization and visualizing the things you want at night and like visualizing your shots and all these different things. So I'm guessing that I did do some of that, you know, but never really deliberately and with intention, which is, you know, how I'm doing it now. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's making a huge difference. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that, you know, you, found multiple multiple uses for it um just you know some of the stuff you're saying is you know it's good to hear that it had that effect and it's something that you know you approached maybe with an open mind and see the benefits instead of just being like closed off to to the idea like um one other positive thing that uh I, I saw a quote from another interview that you did with uh, an Arizona news outlet earlier in this year. And you said, uh, you know, one of the best lessons that you learned as an Arizona state wrestler was not having my ego attached to the results. So keeping it, you know, in that positive mindset, what's one of the best lessons you learned as a WWE wrestler? Um, well, I mean, actually, so, 
I mean, I, that was actually a lesson I learned while being a WWE wrestler because I, uh, you know, in amateur wrestling, I was able to control the outcome, you know, more so than in, mm-hmm. in obviously pro wrestling. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, on along the lines of that kind of ego detachment is the uh, larger kind of bigger picture, which is having growth mindset versus having a fixed mindset. And in order to have a growth mindset, in my opinion, you have to have your ego attached to your process, right? You can't have your, you know, uh, if you're having your ego attached to the outcomes, which is, you know, the successes or the failures, like then the way you feel about yourself is, is either going to be really good or really bad. And it's all going to be dependent on, you know, whether the things that you've been doing ultimately lead you to be successful in a particular moment or not. And those particular moments are obviously quite fleeting. So, you know, to live and die by the sword, if you will, is, is not the, well, is not the best way to find peace and happiness on the inside. It's to derive your self-worth from, you know, your journey, your process, the things that you do on a daily basis that help you to improve. And then the outcomes are the things with which let you know if your process or how you need to work on your process or how you need to tweak your process or fix your process. So, you know, yeah, as a younger man, I like when I win wrestling matches, I'd be super pumped up about myself. And when I lose a match, I beat myself up and, you know, just be talking in my head about how much I'm an idiot and all all this negative self-talk, you know, and, and I did that still when I got into, into pro wrestling and, and I realized like, Whoa, I don't have any control over like the outcomes here, any of that kind of stuff. Like I can't have my ego attached to those things or else my, you know, my self-esteem is going to be just, you know, at the whims of things that I can't control. And you really want your self-esteem to be, you know, based on things that you have direct control over, obviously, because that's how you feel about yourself. Um, and having, you know, having my wife and having a, a child now, a three-year-old daughter, that's helped a lot too, to, you know, be able to, okay, direct some of that energy where my identity was mostly wrestler, you know, now is I can say, okay, well, a big part of my identity is being a father and being a husband and so deriving my self-worth from those things has been helpful also, you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, just the process of pro wrestling and kind of the judgment that happens all the time, you know, and learning how to like, take that constructive criticism and figure out how, how to like apply the things that apply, throw the things away that don't apply and, you know, only feel how you feel about yourself based on the effort that you're giving on a daily basis, um, you know, has been pretty critical, I think, for my mental health. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, something that is being more addressed more and more. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like that you, you put it the way you did. And that that's why the quote resonated with me, maybe not you know, when it was said, but just allowing yourself to, you know, you like have your day dictated by like that negativity is like, it, it's so overpowering and being able to take yourself out of that and focus on yourself and focus on like what matters. It, it's so important. And, you know, like, like you said, you, you're not just a wrestler, you're, you're a father, a husband, uh, you know, Star Wars fan. I could see the Falcon behind you. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, did did you feel like it was harder to do that because you you're coming from being an, an amateur athlete or being an amateur wrestler, or did you just find like you know once it clicked, it was you know you you, you reached a certain point where it, it all made sense, and then you just kind of did it. Um, I mean, I definitely think it probably helped, kind of um, understanding like where, so, I mean, one of the things I love so much about amateur wrestling is that there's this direct correlation between what you give and what you get. Right. And like, not everything in life is that way. There's not a direct correlation between how much effort you put in and sort of the benefits that you get back from, you know, all that effort. Uh, and not that like in the long run in professional wrestling, that's not the case. Cause I think it definitely is the case, you know, that the cream rises to the top eventually. And if you're putting in the work day after day, after day, year after year, after year, like you're going to become undeniable at some point, but maybe in a microcosm, 
Um, there's not always a direct correlation between what you give and what you get, you know, in the micro sense, maybe when I'm just talking about like booking or whatever the case may be. Um, so I know, you know, for me, like kind of having, having that as an amateur athlete and just understanding how to build value from the daily work that you put in, you know, is paramount, you know, because I think I see sometimes in, in professional wrestling that people who have just been kind of you know in pro wrestling or or acting drama you know that kind of uh, avenue which i didn't do a lot of growing up is like super subjective and, and very judgmental is not necessarily as co concrete as some you know athletics are that somebody wins somebody loses we can easily see you no know, performance based you know and so one person's opinion may be this and another person's opinion may be that. And you kind of have to figure out how to like, well, whose opinion do I listen to? Like whose opinions do I value? That was something that was very difficult for me to figure out how to kind of like, you know, go through that basically and, and just figure those things out. Um, whereas maybe somebody who had grew up in that Avenue, I already kind of figured out how to tease between like, okay, this person doesn't have my best interests in mind. So when they're saying something to me, like, I'll just tell them, thank you, but I won't really take it to heart. Whereas like this other person, I can tell that they genuinely want to help me. So everything they tell me, I should really take it to heart and, and value that, uh, you know, opinion. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't realize this uh, until recently, but I remember the first time I saw it, heavy machinery together it was the wrestlemania 33 ticket party uh, i lived in orlando at the time i went and <laughs> outside yeah like outside of the i forget what the place was the dr yeah, phillips the, center um, dr phillips center yeah yeah and so some something just clicked about you guys like i i was like all right these guys like you know you 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 work well together you can move but here's the part i didn't realize that was only your 11th match together total like you barely were teaming together. You were in the dusty classic, like just made your TV debut, but you got like, I, for some reason thought you guys had been a team a lot longer than you were. So obviously you guys caught on in, in the long term. but what made it click for you early on? Like, how did you know, like this could be something fruitful for the two of you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've said, I, I said this in an interview last week, I think, and, you know, like, um, it became apparent pretty quickly to me anyways, that like we had something here that was going to work out because, um, there was just a foundational level of understanding between the two of us that, you know, so he grew up in Superior, Wisconsin. I grew up in Hubbard, Oregon, both kind of, you know, middle-class blue collar, small town type upbringing and then on top of that we're both highly successful amateur wrestling heavyweights which like being a successful amateur wrestler that's like one blanket but heavyweights kind of fall under a different category you know we're like mm -hmm. a little different than all the other amateur most of us didn't have to cut weight so we were we're like always happy and not like you know miserable spitting in a cup or whatever we're just eating burgers enjoying our lives and beating people up so i think because both of us kind of already had, you know, those two things. Uh, I mean, what's understood doesn't have to be said or talked about really. So it was like that. Okay. Like, Hey, I know what you did. You know what I did. We're not going to try to measure dicks here or nothing. We're on the same team. Let's get it on. Yeah. And, you know, from like the very beginning. And then I think also there was another layer behind just like, I have a, a younger brother um, who, he uh who has asperger's right so i'm very protective of my younger brother um and uh well i don't know how to say that. Like, uh I, I i enjoyed helping otis out not just in the ring but outside of the ring as well in some of the areas where he you know not that he reminded me of my little brother but that like i kind of felt the same protective you know like that bond or relationship exactly sort of. you know, yep and so uh, that obviously kind of, you know, and I think, and he truly looked at me as his big brother, you know I mean? And we still talk every single week. Like we, we have a very deep friendship and the things that happen, you know, inside of WWE can not and would not ever have, you know, really an effect on our relationship or our brotherhood. 
And so, yeah, I mean, I think it was that kind of foundational level and understanding that we, you know, we had with each other that just meant, okay, well, we have a bond because of these things. What did you tell him when he uh, cut his hair and shaved his beard? <laughs> well, I just, I told him, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was pretty sure it probably wasn't him. So, you know. Yeah. 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 It, uh, I, it, it's working for him right now, but um, it, it's kind of funny how, and, and this is like an idea I had, but in talking about the way you guys split up, uh, I, I know in other calls you've said that you know you, you didn't really know about it and there was no really follow-up or no plan but i feel like you know there could have been this uh kind of like a southern justice tag team sort of deal if, if you want to look at you know how the godwins went from hog farmer to like a mercenary i i really feel like that uh i i, I don't know i mean they shaved their face and they were all clean cut wearing the suits. I feel like that could have been something cool to explore. But uh, now that I, you know, ranted a little bit about my personal booking, <laughs> uh, like, did you pitch any other ideas for whether it was like you guys to reunite or, you know, once you split like yourself on your own, anything that, you know, you really felt passionate about that maybe just didn't, I mean, it didn't come to fruition, but maybe something I mean, you thought yeah, could have. So I, I personally tried to get like a, like a kind of country club uh, asshole, for lack of a better term. You know, I'm a fan of golf. I like golf. I know the jargon and lingo of professional golf. So, you know, I had some discussions about maybe, you know, a golf guy. He has, you know, maybe he comes to the ring with the club. You know, maybe he has a glove on that's like – his thing or something, you know, and he dresses in polos and he's, um, you know, he just kind of acts like a general, uh, pompous kind of cocky guy who has money, who's came from, you know, kind of a better background than everyone else, if you will. Um, you know, and I, we, I talked about a few other things with people, uh, potentially joining in, um, with a couple other groups maybe, but nothing really felt like it had, you know, gotten any, any, uh, real traction, I guess you could say. And, you know, I think there was a part of me too, that kind of, I mean, once, once we split and there, there wasn't really a match, like, um, I kind of felt lost creatively as well. And WWE, like TV is not the best place to try to kind of like tinker with something creatively, right? Like you need to have something that's pretty polished and ready to go on TV. And I don't know that I had like something outside of heavy machinery that was ready for that, you know? And I ultimately, I feel like that's, that's the reason why I got released. Um, and, you know, so part of that's on me, of course, is like, um, you know, I had other ideas and I pitched them, but if, you know, I don't know that any of those guys were ideas or that I even knew like who I was inside of the ring without outside of heavy machinery. Cause I never, you know, like I didn't really wrestle on the Indies before I started with WWE. I basically came straight from college and went to the performance center, you know, and tinkered around with, with different ideas. But then for all well, three and a half or four years, I was, you know, Tucker as a member of Heavy Machinery. And that was kind of where the majority of my mental energy, you know, went. Um, and when we split, I felt like, well, we still had a lot more to do. Um, and, you know, so I think ultimately that was kind of the reason why I wasn't able to get anything else, you know, going. My time there was just um, like once, once we, once I turned on him and then we didn't have a match after that then or like some kind of avenue immediately afterwards for me to try to transition into something new then it kind of felt like mm, i don't know if we're ever going to go like if i'm ever going to be able to get anything going here again you know in this in the way that things are going especially during the pandemic there's no fans it's pretty hard to try and like debut something new under those circumstances as well I know it probably sounds like I'm making excuses, but like I said earlier, I mean, I know it's part big time on me there for, you know, not being, I guess, ready enough for that moment. And 
uh, you know, to just, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I live with it the way it is. I, I think people can understand where you're coming from. I mean, wrestling's pretty much built and centers around entertaining the fans and reacting to the fans. So if you don't have that sort of sounding board and feeling like you're in this, you know, closed environment and it, you know, for, for what it was, it, it was a reaction to the pandemic, but you don't have that feedback. So maybe that does stunt your creativity, but now, you know, moving forward, things are opening back up. You're in a different place, uh, you know, mentally you're, you're, you're a little more positive and, you know, you're in a different environment. You're at home now, you know, it, there's a ton of possibilities now moving forward. Um, you know, as I mentioned, starting out, you know, by the time this call is released, you're going to be a free agent. Is there, I mean, are you going to hit the ground running like July 15th? You, you have anything you want to tease coming out or you you know, anything you have thoughts about moving forward now that, you know, you can kind of control your own destiny. Yeah. I mean, so I got some, you know, I got some different signings and things that I, I have booked coming up here. Um, uh, end of July, I'll be in New York city for three days. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm looking to wrestle. Um, I don't have anything, you know, concrete as of yet wrestling wise. Um, we got a few things out in the air that I'm, you know, don't have, fully ironed down yet so um, but yeah i mean I'm, for me i'm mainly looking to wrestle on the indies for you know six months to a year probably at least um so that i can really tinker with some stuff and you know like i said i, I know what where i want to start my foundation out and i have a couple other ideas you know as kind of um somebody who is you know very calm and very zen and understands that as soon as it's time for the calmness and the Zen to go away, then, um, you know, that's when it's time for violence. And, you know, that's kind of going to be the initial um, thing for me. So, you know, just ba base amateur wrestler and then sort of a force of nature, if you will, you know, the kind of uh, shift that nature is capable of undergoing of, you know, being this calm kind of uh, beautiful, relaxing thing that can, you know, make you feel those types of emotions. And then of the flip of a switch, it rolls in and all of a sudden it invokes fear. Um, you know, that's going to be kind of what I'm looking to do is, hey, look, like I don't need to be intense and I don't need to be, you know, angry and I don't need to bring the noise all that often. But when I do, you know that, it's going to be real serious. It's not going to be funny or joking around anymore. No, it's going to be, you know, time to put people on their asses and time to hit people and time to put it on them, you know, time to get down with the things that made me who I am, the things that are the reason why. I mean, I became a division one all American wrestler, you know, because of because of the work that I put in and because of the way that I'm able to systematically use my hands to break down other human beings. And I feel like I haven't had the opportunity to show those things over the last year to 18 months in the way that I would want to present them. And so going forward, you know, that's, that's the thing that excites me the most. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's like, all right, you know, now like I'm in control of my destiny. You know, if, if I was going to place a bet on somebody, I would certainly wish to place that bet on me and be in full control of that. And, uh, you know, it's time to get it on. Yeah. No, I, I look forward to hopefully you check out um, some East Coast places I can go check out because it, it sounds like, a, not to put a label on it, but like an Iceman character where, you know, cool, calm and collected. And then as soon as the bell rings, it's like, OK, the opponent knows like, oh, I, I screwed up. Immediately. <laughs> right. Immediately. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, it, it's a watch list. If there's a match that you've had that, you know, you want to show people maybe for the first time for a repeat viewing, is there a match that you've had, whether it was a tag match or a singles match that, you know, you would really point to and say, that's the guy that I want people to see, or that's what I'm most proud of coming from my WWE career. Anything come to mind? 
I mean, TV wise, honestly, right before the pandemic started, you know, we, Otis and I, we wrestled in a gauntlet match right before the elimination chamber. We went 53 minutes on TV through six segments. Um, uh, you know, I was, I didn't feel fully confident in myself that I was, you know, be able to do that, but watching it back, was it a, you know, glorious masterpiece? No, it wasn't, but you know, you we made a hot tag 48 minutes into that 53 minutes and the crowd was still there and they were with us for that tag. So, you know, I feel, and then the elimination chamber right after that, um, even though we weren't in it for that long, I feel like, you know, we had one of the more memorable moments in that match. Um, in terms of a match that happened, I don't know if this is available to see or not, but in our last year in NXT, uh, we had this house show match in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin with Sanity, Eric Young, and Alexander Wolf. Those guys are awesome. Oh, they're so good, especially EY. He's the man. And, uh, man, it was probably like an 18-minute house show match, and we worked the bear hug the whole time. And like, I mean, we got the bear hug massively over, like to the point where we we're in the heat and they're beating Otis down in the heat. And EY goes to do like a double axe handle off the second and Otis catches him in a bear hug for hope spot. And the place just erupts, you know, and it was like, man, we like you could still do that. You know, it's like a lot of people and I shouldn't say a lot of people, but obviously we're not going to be the style of doing you know, crazy things. Like I'm not ricochet. I can't do all that stuff. You know what I mean? Or whatever. Yeah. And props to people who can, like, I'm not trying to disparage them. That's awesome. And it, and it works for them, but for us, that's never going to work. So, Hey, two fat guys, like throwing human beings back and forth between each other and potentially like having the reaction of the night from the audience, you know, is something that I feel very proud of um, because you know, when I was coming up in NXT and learning about old school pro wrestling and, and how to tell an old school story and that it's not all about high spots and whatever, and you can really get engagement with the audience by just telling a good story and coming back to the well and doing the right things over and over again and having a good payoff. Uh, you know, it's it works and doesn't work every single time, but um, you know, I, I love Terry Gordy and I love Stan Hansen and I love Dr. Death. Those are my favorite guys to watch. Those are who I love. And that's the style of pro wrestling that I want to try to do that. I want to try to make work in 2021. And, you know, I, I hope it does. I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's, this is kind of cliche, but, you know, it's flavors of ice cream. I think people should look at it that way more instead of, you know, yes or no, black and white. But uh, I, I look forward to seeing what you're doing. Like, I, I'm excited for your future. Um, you know, hopefully, like I said, we'll, we'll see you on the East Coast or wherever you go. But um, you guys can follow along real Levi Cooper on Twitter, anywhere else they can check you out. Um, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been getting down on Twitch quite often. So I'm at, at Levi Cooper live on Twitch. Uh, I probably only had like 15 streams, but I'm, you know, starting to do it three, four times a week. Um, I'm going to start doing yoga on there a couple times a week in the morning. Okay. Um, I'm going to start having a Friday afternoon barbecue on there where people can, I'll, I'll put out like a recipe and ingredients People can come and barbecue on Friday on the stream, as well as obviously playing video games. Um, if you like what you heard and you, you want Levi Cooper to come show up in a town near you, you can find, you know, you can find me on my social medias. They're there, but book Levi Cooper at mail.com. That's book Levi Cooper at mail.com. Shoot me an email and, uh, you know, I, I want to wrestle a lot in 2021 and, and 2022, and uh, I'm excited.